Hey, good morning. Do me a favor, let's turn together to Romans chapter 6 as we continue our study through Paul's letter to the church at Rome. Romans chapter 6. I'm sporting uh, Joseph's shirt of many colors today, as you may have noticed. It's uh, part of the Joseph collection. Now, Romans chapter 6. Those of you listening to the CD, check out the video. You should have been here. Um, Identity. What is identity? Identity is the sum, the collection of your memories, your experiences, your relationships, and your values. That, that is your identity. Your memories, your experiences, your relationships, and your values. Uh, amalgamated. Uh, the accumulation of all of those together is your sense of identity. Identity starts to become uh, very cloudy at adolescence. There is a lot of confusion about identity at adolescence, as well as a lot of formation of identity at adolescence. And then as you start to age, you start to take on additional roles. And those additional roles, for example, a relationship role, career or job role, uh, perhaps the relationship of marriage role, the relationship of parent role, those impact your sense of identity. You start to now acquire a different sense of identity or a new sense of identity in each of those roles. Then as you continue to age, achievement becomes even more influential in your sense of identity. And perhaps you've been incredibly successful in many endeavors and so the trajectory starts to look like a hockey stick you know and you just kind of see this chart this graph of your success and you start to place your sense of identity in those achievements and the problem with all of these sense of identity is that they're transient in other words no matter how successful you've been this kind of hockey stick trajectory sooner or later it's going to reach a plane a plateau, and then there's going to be a decline. Your relationship as a spouse, your relationship as a parent, your relationship as a son or daughter, all of those relationships are going to change. Your relationships with friends are going to change. And so in the midst of that change, there is upheaval because what you were building your sense of identity upon was not reliable. It wasn't stable. And so it's critically important that that we understand this concept of identity. You see, no one can escape the struggles of the existential questions. Who am I? We may not be thinking about it every day like some philosopher, but we're all wrestling with this. Who am I? And who do I want my future self to be? And these are important questions that we should struggle with, but they're not the primary question. They're not the most important question because the most important question will yield stability, meaning, purpose, and most importantly, contentment. The issue should not be, who am I? Nor should the issue be, who do I want my future self to be? The issue should be, whose are you? Whose are you? Because if you find your identity in Christ, that identity is going to provide satisfaction, that identity is going to be stable and reliable, and that identity will never be transient. It will continue throughout your life into eternity. And it is so important in the midst of a culture that is giving us messaging about our identity that is in conflict with our identity as children of God, our identity in Christ, that we discover here this important concept of our identity in Christ. So if you'll stand with me, let's do this together. We're in Romans chapter 6. I'm going to read the first five verses out loud to get us started and ask you to follow along silently. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. 
For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I pray that today your people would discover anew our identity in you. Uh, Before we even begin to focus on what we should do, let us discover who we are, what you've called us to be. And may you be the master teacher in this place, and may all of our hearts receive from you. And we pray this now, in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. So what we're talking about, as you've probably gleaned, is our identity in Christ, your identity in Christ. And really the object I think God intends for us today is that we would live for God, that we would live for God. So the first concept we want to consider is that Jesus' followers have a new identity. So for the first five chapters of this letter, Paul has made this airtight case, like a good Jewish attorney, that All of us fall short of God's standard of perfection, whether you're a moralist, whether you were born into God's chosen people, the Jews. All of us are sinners in need of a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus, and the way that we receive salvation or life with Christ is through faith, by committing to Him. That's how we become Jesus' followers. It is God's gracious gift to humanity. So this is the case that Paul's been making for the first five chapters, so he starts in the sixth chapter. Should we continue in sin that grace would abound? In other words, if we are saved by this grace, if we just keep sinning, there'll be more grace that we receive. And he answers his rhetorical question and says, certainly not. In other words, God forbid that we should use God's grace as a license to continue to sin. That was not God's purpose. We're good with that. Amen? And he says at verse 2 that we, were, we are dead to sin. So we're no longer going to continue sin because now we are dead to sin. And to help us to understand this concept that we are dead to sin, Paul now uses baptism as a, a metaphor to explain to us our identity in Christ, our new relationship with God, and our new relationship with sin. And so he begins at verse 3 and then the first part of verse 4 to explain that when we are immersed, when we go under the water, we identify with Jesus in his death, we identify with Jesus in his burial. And when we come up out of the water, he explains in the latter part of verse 4 and verse 5, we identify with Jesus in his resurrection, in this newness of life, this spirit-filled life. As we come up out of the water, we're identifying with Christ in his resurrection. So he says at verse 5 that we are united with Christ. Uh, the Greek term that we translate united was used of a, a, a branch that was grafted into a tree. In other words, you are in Christ. Amen? And Christ is in you as well. You cannot separate the two. It has been grafted in, so it has become one, new identity. But he uses this term in verse 3 and 4, baptize. It was the Greek term baptizo. And baptizo was used commonly in regard to dyeing linen. Okay, so if you have white linen cloth and you put this white linen cloth and you immerse it in purple dye, you no longer have white linen cloth. Amen? You have purple cloth. It has a new identity. As you take that cloth out, you're not saying, oh, check out that white linen. It's no, it's purple. It has a completely new identity. You have a new identity. As Paul would write to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that you're a new creation. All things have been passed away. Right now, now in Christ, you are completely new. You are a new creation, new identity. And identity is this incredibly powerful concept. As you just think about it uh, with me for a moment, as you look back at your life, no matter if you're a young person here today, if you may be a, a seasoned veteran of a few campaigns of life, if you've earned some of these natural highlights, so to speak, as you think about your life, think how your identity has shifted through the years. 
Um, when I grew up, man, baseball was my jam. I, I love playing ball. And so I saw myself a, as a baseball player. That's how I would identify. Uh, later in life, and as an adolescent, I rebelled and, and started using drugs. I'm not advocating that. If I could go back and change time, I certainly wouldn't advocate it. God has redeemed that. But I certainly would have seen myself as a stoner, a doper. Again, it's nothing I'm, I'm proud of. Um, my late teen years, I started producing music, uh, then coming out of college and grad school, became an attorney. Those things would shape my identity. I came to faith in Christ. I became a believer. That certainly changed some of my sense of identity. Later, I became a Bible teacher. I became a husband. I became a father. I became a uh, Pastor, I became a church planter. All of those things have impacted my sense of identity. It's shifted through the years. But I want to encourage you that all of your sense of identity, apart from Christ, is competing with your sense of identity in Christ. I, I mean, if you're here today and um, you know you identify as a Clippers fan. There's certainly been a lot of you lately that have come to the forefront, praise God. And then there's some of you who identify as Laker fan that are certainly more excited this year than you have been for a while. Or you identify because of your career. You identify because of your accomplishments. You start to think about how you identify as a spouse, as a parent, or your relationship. Think about how your identity has changed through the years, and how these different stages are competing with the sense of identity in Christ. Okay, so we're going to take a moment to discuss this in groups. So what I want you to do is just turn around, grab a couple folks, and, and get to know one another by just being honest and sharing how your identity has changed. And go, we've got four minutes. All right, all right, all right. Let's come on back, people. All right. Yeah. Good job, everybody. Well done. Good job. Okay, so Paul has been explaining to us, in Christ we have this new identity, that Jesus, as a follower of Jesus, as a child of God, this should be our primary identity. And because we have this new identity in Christ, we have now a new relationship with God and a new relationship with sin. And that's the, the idea that Paul's going to develop beginning at verse 6. So let's take a look at verse uh, 6 and 7 together. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from Sin. So uh, the first thought is the old life dominated by rebellion against God is dead. The old life dominated by rebellion against God is dead. That we identify with Jesus in his crucifixion so that the old man or the old nature or this carnal nature that was set on rebelling against God is no longer controlling our attitudes. It is no longer controlling our actions that we are no longer dominated by that way of thinking and doing. That life is dead. And as Paul would say, you cannot tempt a corpse to be thinking of yourself, reckon yourself as dead. So we've been set free. Free from sin, he says at verse 7. He'll repeat that thought at verse 18 and verse 22, that we are free from sin. So to clarify, does this mean that we have attained moral perfection this side of eternity? No. But we've been freed from sin in the sense that it is no longer controlling us. And because it is no longer controlling us, we are progressively yielding more and more of our will to God to become more and more like Jesus. It is a process and it is progressive. That is the idea that... that He's communicating, but we have this new sense of identity. The things that we used to do are no longer controlling us. 
You know, the, the story is told of, of the early church theologian, Augustine, and, and that one day he was walking down the street and his former mistress from prior to his conversion was passing by. And as they walked by, Augustine just kept walking speedily and she shouted, Augustine, it's me, it's me. And he looked over his shoulder and shouted back, it's no longer me, no longer me. That it was a new man, a, a new creation. That the things that previously dominated his life were being transformed. Now, sometimes we're, we're consciously aware of, of struggles in our life that are dominating us, and, and sometimes, as the Lord says, "Let there be light." He shines light on those things and become aware of them, but uh, other times, simply by the fact that we have become now spiritual beings endued with a spiritual life, that the Spirit is in us, we find ourselves being transformed after our conversion supernaturally in a very natural way. That we may not have been trying to stop doing this or to start doing this, but all of a sudden we find that our values are changing, the behavior is changing, our actions and our attitudes are changing because of our new identity. The new life displays the resurrected Christ. Look with me at verse 8. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. And, and so there was this idea that Paul brings out beginning at verse 8 that we are identifying not only with Christ in his death and burial, but we have also identified in his resurrection and his life. That there is this awareness that Christ is in us now and he is to be displayed. When Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 3, he says, I've been crucified with Christ. He was consciously aware that this life that he lived prior to his conversion was no longer going to dominate. That life was dead to him. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. He's got this awareness that Christ is now living in him to be displayed. And because he has this new life and new identity, it is going to be revealed through a process as he continually makes progress in yielding more of himself to Christ. Uh, I have never been personally involved in fostering or adopting, and I think it's an incredibly noble and good thing, an incredibly needed thing in our community. And I, I praise God that there are many families in this community of faith who have accepted that calling, that God has placed that desire in their hearts, and that they have impacted and changed the lives and the trajectory of countless children. That's a glorious thing, amen? And you can imagine, uh, whether you've had this experience or not, some of the challenges of whatever your upbringing, whatever your point of reference, and now you're coming into a new home, and as you are adopted, you have this new identity, and you're wondering whether it's going to be stable. You, you wonder whether it's all going to collapse like a house of cards. And, and as you become through a process just aware that this is safe, this is good, this is going to be something where love will endure, you start to trust. You start to be vulnerable. You're no longer looking at these rules and these values in a new home, in a new family as something that you have to do. You've understood that those who have created these boundaries in your life love you and they want what's best for you. And, and so you want to do them. You want to adopt these values. You want to adopt this sense of identity. You want to become part of this culture because you have this new identity. And it's a process. And it's no different for us as, as we come into God's kingdom. Um, we begin to understand that God is good, that his boundaries are for us, that he loves us. And so we start to adopt his values. We learn his values. We adopt those values. We display those values. You know, one of the great things when I was a First starting to teach the Bible in a local church, a, a smaller church, I was teaching three and four-year-olds. If, if Three and four-year-olds are the best age to teach. 
No offense. But, you know, you say to a, a three-year-old, you know, who made the sky blue? Jesus! Who made the grass green? Jesus! What'd you have for breakfast today? Jesus! That's a good thing to start your day, amen? You know, and, and you try to explain to a three- or four-year-old that Jesus is in them. A three- or four-year-old intuitively understands if Jesus is in me, he, he's big, I'm not, he's going to stick out. Right? That's the idea. He's supposed to stick out. People are supposed to see. Now, now how does this happen? The new life is lived to please God. The new life is lived to please God. Look with me, if you would, at verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in all its lusts. And do not pre present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace." So um, here, beginning at, at verse 10, Paul says, The death that Jesus died, he died once for all, but the life he lives, see this at verse 10, he lives to God. And then at verse 11, Paul says, Likewise, you also reckon yourself dead to sin, but alive to God. So the, first, let's stop with this word reckon. You know, uh, Hey, looks like good weather today. I reckon so. That's not what he's talking about here. This Greek term is talking about making something inoperative. It is this idea of, what is this idea? Where did I write this down in my notes here? It's got to be here somewhere. Well, I'll get to it. Um, maybe. Maybe I won't. Um, okay, reckon. To, goodness. I reckon to consider account or understand your position and live it regardless of your feelings, right? So to reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God is to consider it, count, to understand it and live it regardless of your feelings, right? So if you reckon yourself married, okay, you have entered into this covenant relationship where you are committed to respect one another, you are committed to love one another, to honor one another, amen? you, you got to reckon because sometimes you're not going to feel like that, amen? Yeah, some of you don't want to say that because of the person sitting next to you, but you reckon yourself. You consider yourself, you account, you understand, and you live that regardless of your feelings. This is what Paul is saying. You reckon yourself dead to sin, just like Jesus died once for all. In verse 11, he goes on to say, but alive to God. That no longer is sin dominating my life, but I am going to live for God. And then he continues on at verse 12 and 13. He says, no longer are we going to present our lives, our members, our life, as instruments of unrighteousness. But now we're going to see ourselves as instruments of God's disposal, instruments of righteousness living for God. So a mind that is transformed by God, our thoughts honor him. Our thoughts are about him. Our, our thoughts seek to yield to him. Thoughts that are contrary to him, we want to take captive. It's like, no, I should not be looking there. I should not be thinking there. I should not be seeing that. I'm not going there. I'm, we're putting blinders on. A heart that has been transformed by God impacts our mouth because out of the abundance of the what? Heart, the mouth speaks, Jesus said. So words now are, are becoming encouraging, inspiring, we are sharing about Jesus. We are speaking words of love in, or words of truth in love. We are speaking words that encourage and give hope. What is coming out of our lips change. We've got in, in the kitchen, there are all these drawers marked, all these cabinets marked in the office, uh, the kitchen in the church office. And my favorite one is the one that says, serving utensils. <laughs> 
And I expect to open it and find God's people in there. I, I'm, I'm constantly disappointed to find tongs and spoons and the like. Serving utensils. That this is what we are supposed to be. We're, we're supposed to be God's instruments to serve God by serving one another. That your hands and your feet are instruments at God's disposal. Your life is an instrument at God's disposal to serve Him. And as Paul would say at verse 14, not because you're under some law, but because you're under grace. That when you see yourselves and your primary identity is living for God, when you ask yourself, how, how could I live for God? You live for God because you make the decision that that is your primary identity. You see this connection. As soon as Christ becomes your primary identity, you're going to live for God. And you cannot live for God while your primary identity is something else. If my primary identity is pastor, that still can be an obstacle to living for God. If my primary identity is husband, father, friend, cyclist, Dodger fan, lover of dogs, whatever the case might be, all of those, see this with me, are competing with our primary identity, which should be in Christ. Whatever you see yourself as, other than a child of God, is in competition. If your recreation is your jam, if your sports team, celebrity, your house, your work, your accomplishments... Whatever it is, it's in competition. And left unchecked, it will obscure identity in Christ. And once it obscures identity in Christ, you're chasing that thing to be your source of contentment rather than chasing the one who truly is your source of contentment. And as soon as you make the decision that Christ has to be my primary sense of identity... And everything else has to be kept at a, a short leash. Everything else has to be tethered. Everything else is in competition and left unchecked. It is going to obscure my true identity in Jesus and I am going to live for that thing. I see it all the time. I've seen it happen in my own life. Living for baseball. Living for drugs. Living for rock and roll. This sounds like, <laughs> like drugs, rock and roll. Um, and being an attorney. Being successful. Making it all, all about the, the trappings of that success. Becoming a, a follower of Christ. A believer. But still not understanding what that meant in its fullness of, of my primary identity. Then becoming a Bible teacher and getting affirmation about that. Then becoming a pastor and getting affirmation about that, experiencing success and becoming a church planter here 24 years ago, experiencing success in that. All of those things were an obstacle. If Bruce today could go back to Bruce years ago, all the way back to baseball Bruce. You know, baseball Bruce for three years of Little League wore number one on his uniform because I was always the smallest kid, man. I always looked like the mascot, you know. In high school, I graduated to number two because it was the lowest number they had to offer. Right? Just, if I could go back and tell that young boy, man, you need to put your identity in Christ. Everything else is unstable. You might think it's solid. My career, it's solid. My wealth management, it's solid. My portfolio, it's rock solid. My relationship, it's solid. If it's not Jesus that we're talking about, it's not. And when it gets exposed for what it really is, sand, not a rock, your life implodes because you built it on something that wouldn't stand. And that collision is inevitable. And the damage that it's going to cause is solely dependent on how much of your life is built on the foundation of Jesus 
as your identity as opposed to something else. Coming to church is fantastic. I, I, I'm obviously biased, you know. I like it. Um, right, we understand there's value because we, we should be learning about God. We should be growing as worshipers of, of God. We should be collectively coming to encourage one another, to build one another up, to honor and worship him. That's what it's all about, amen? But, you know, if, if you take an hour and a half a couple times a month, and you equate that somehow in your thinking that that is sufficient to make identity. Man, it's so easy to figure out what somebody is all about in a half hour over a cup of whatever beverage you're drinking. Right? People are talking what, what their jam is. It's not hard to figure out. And so as you think about your life, do the people around you, do, do they get the sense from you that Jesus is your jam? That's who you're about. Now, there's nothing wrong with having secondary identities, whatever your, your thing might be. But has that secondary identity obscured your primary identity? Um, I remember when I was going to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, I was a brand new believer, and somebody make a, made a program announcement about they're getting a softball team going, and I just thought, man, this is, this is my jam. And, and so I got involved with church softball, and so all these guys had been mature Christians for a long, long time. And I remember one night we had the first game, and that, that's the early game is where wives and girlfriends show up. They don't show up at the late game. And, and so... This lady said to her husband, who are you guys playing tonight? And his response was, the Christians. And she said, honey, we're Christians. And he said, no, not like these guys. They're the real deal. And um, these were the guys who took me under the wing, so to speak, who mentored me. The first time that I ever taught a Bible study, it was with this group of, of guys who encouraged me. And they had a lot of diverse interests. Uh, they were into a lot of things. But it, it wasn't hard for anybody to figure out that Jesus was the number one thing. And let me just encourage you. Whatever else you're making your identity in is not going to satisfy. But if you make Jesus your identity, that you're his child, that is never going to be threatened. Everything else is going to be threatened. It's unstable. It's not reliable. Your identity in Christ will never be threatened. And not only that, it will never end. It will continue into eternity. 50 years from now, I'm not going to be a pastor, a dad, a husband, a friend, uh, amazingly good looking like I am at this moment. My only identity is going to be child of God. And if you are his, it's just a matter of time for each and every one of us. The sooner we realize this and adopt this as an identity, the sooner we will live for God and the whole thing works because then sin will no longer dominate our lives. We won't abuse this grace as a license to sin, but we'll live for God and be his instruments to impact our community. Amen? So I want to give you a chance to make that decision. If you'll just close your eyes and open up your heart. Father, there are many of us in this room who have allowed something else to become our identity. We recognize that these other things are competing for our affections and our attention. We confess to you, Lord, as a people we are sorry that we've let these things obscure your love for us. Father, I'm sure in a gathering this size that there are people here who don't know you yet. And they're looking to answer the, these great questions. Who am I? Who do I want to be? And I pray, Lord, that each of us here would discover that the most important question we can ask is, whose are we? And if you're here today and you have never received Christ as Savior, today you can become his child. As soon as you make a decision in your heart that you are ready to follow Jesus and to commit your life to him, 
He has promised that all of the sin that has separated you from God up until this point will be forgiven and that you will receive spiritual life and God's spirit will be in you, Christ will be in you so that you can live with God from this day forward, that you can live for God from this day forward. And if that's you right now, just in the quiet of your heart, let God know whether it's for the first time or just a reminder, Lord, I want to live for you from this day forward. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.